When you suck on a straw which is dipped in water, the water rises up. Pretty simple, right? But here's a question. What makes the water rise up? What forces it to go up? If you're thinking suction, then we'll have to think again, okay? And what about giant pipes that we have in our cities and you know the ones that come to our houses? What makes the water flow there? Is it the same forces that we're dealing with over here or something different? That's what we're gonna figure out in this video, so let's begin. We'll start with the most fundamental question. What makes a fluid flow? Well, we know from Newton's laws, if there's an unbalanced force acting on an object, it'll accelerate. Well, something very similar is gonna happen over here. Instead of forces, we're gonna deal with pressure. If there's an unbalanced pressure, or in other words, if there's a difference in the pressure between two points in a fluid, that fluid is going to flow. That's what you need, a difference in the pressure. So let's use this insight and see if we can answer original questions. So let's go back to, you know, sucking that water on the straw, okay? And let's look at this from the side view. Let's concentrate on the column of the water that is inside the straw over here, only on that particular column of water, and think about what are the forces that are acting on it. Well, first of all, we know the air is pushing from the top, so there is this atmospheric pressure. We know that this column of liquid has its own weight, gravity is pulling down on it, so there's a force of gravity acting on it. And we know that there is a pressure from the bottom, we'll just call that as PB. And now I know all these forces are balanced because this water column is in equilibrium, it's neither accelerating up nor down. So how do I balance these forces? Well, the forces from the bottom should exactly equal the forces from the top. What's the force from the bottom? Well, we know the pressure from the bottom. Well, if I consider the area of the cross-section to be just A, then the force from the bottom is pressure times area. What's the force from the top? Well, it's the gravitational force plus this pressure times area. So we can write down an equation. We could say that the force from the bottom, which is the pressure times area from the bottom, that should equal the force of gravity plus the pressure times area from the top. Does that make sense? Okay. But we know what the force of gravity is. It's just mass of this column of liquid times G. And you know, mass is just the density times the volume. So it'll be the density of this fluid, which is water, times the volume of this particular column. So we can just write as density times volume. And finally, what's the volume of this column of water? Well, it's a cylinder. So the volume of a cylinder is just the area times the height. So if we plug that in, we get our final expression. This is now the equilibrium condition. This is the case when, you know, there are no net forces acting on the on, on this column of water, it's an equilibrium. But now let's see what happens when you suck on that straw. Well, when you do that, some of the air molecules are gone from this, you know, from, from the straw. And so the air pressure over here drops. So the air pressure reduces, okay? But what about this pressure from the bottom? Well, that stays the same because that depends upon the depth and the atmospheric pressure outside, which is the same. Only the pressure inside the straw has reduced, which means, look, the left-hand side stays the same, but the right-hand side has reduced. And therefore, this is no longer equal. Now, the force from the bottom is larger than the total force from the top, and therefore, there will be a net force acting upwards pushing the liquid up. So you can see what causes the net force acting upwards, the difference in the pressure. That's what's causing it, and that's what's going to push the liquid up. There is no suction pull, but it's actually being pushed from the bottom because the pressure from the top reduced. That is how the liquid comes up. But now, the next question could be, well, how high will it rise? Well. Again, think about it. As the height increases, this value starts increasing, right? So at some height, let's call that as h prime, for example, some new height, the sum will again be equal to the left-hand side. And when that happens, another equilibrium state is reached, and that's when the water stops rising. Again, long story short, what caused the water to rise up? It's not a suction power. There is no such thing as suction pull. It's the due to the difference of the pressure, because the pressure from the top reduced, the pressure from the bottom, that is the one that pushed the liquid up. All right, on to the next question. What makes the water flow in these pipes, you know, on into our houses, into our taps, for example? Is it the same phenomena? Is it the same idea or is, some, is it something different? Why don't you pause the video and think about this? All right, so usually we'll have a giant water tower. So the whole idea is that because of this huge height, the pressure of the water here would be very high. It's gonna be the same equation as we saw before, the atmospheric pressure plus rho gh. Now because h is 
big. This number is pretty big. And so the pressure at the bottom is very high. And that makes sense, right? All of that water is pushing onto it, providing a lot of pressure. All right. Now, what about the pressure in your houses? Let's say when you open the tap, for example, what is the pressure over here? Well, when you open the tap over here, this is open to the atmosphere. So the pressure over here is the atmospheric pressure. Ooh, can you see the pressure here is much larger than the pressure here. And therefore, that difference in the pressure will push the water into the tap over here. I mean, there's water everywhere, but it just pushes. It, now the water starts moving, and that's how the water flows out. So the idea is exactly the same as before. It's the difference in the pressure that pushes the water. Amazing, right? All right, so the final question for us now is, what decides the speed at which the water flows? How do we figure that out? Well, let's see, let's zoom in over here. And let's consider a couple of cross-sectional area. Let's consider a cross-sectional area over here as A1. And let's consider the cross-sectional area over here as A2. Our goal is to think about what is the connection between the speed at which the water is flowing here and the water is flowing over here. How do we think about that? Now, if we model the water as an incompressible fluid, then we could say that the volume of the water that's flowing in over here per second, that's what we call the volume flow, how much water is flowing in per second, um, that should equal the volume of the water that's flowing out here per second. Does that make sense? Think about it. If there's 5 ml of water flowing in over here every second, well, then 5 ml of water should come out every second. If less comes out, then there's some water that's getting compressed over here, right? So that can't be true. It has to be exactly the same if, you know, if we model it to be incompressible, which is a pretty good model, okay? So... Now let's see if we can figure out what the volume flow in rate, volume flow rate over here is. How do we figure out the volume flow rate? Well, there are multiple ways to think about it. Here's how I like to think about it. Let's assume that the speed at which the water is flowing in, I don't know, let's just call it as V1, and the speed at which the water is flowing out as V2, right? Okay, now consider some water molecules that are right over here. Now, if I wait for one second, then in one second, these water molecules will move to the right because the whole, flow, the whole thing is moving to the right, okay? But how much does it move to the right in one second? Well, its speed is V1. That means it moves, it travels V1 meters per second. So if I wait for exactly one second, these molecules would have traveled the distance of V1 meters. Make sense? Okay. Now, there were some molecules over here before that would have also you know, traveled the exact same distance and they would have come over here. There were some molecules to the left of that, they would have come over here. There are some molecules over here, they would have come over here. And there were some molecules over here, they would have eventually come over here. So this means in that one second that we waited for, look, this much fluid, this much water went through this cross section. So this is the volume of the water that went through in one second. That's the volume flow rate, isn't it? So I just need to know what the volume of this is. That would be the volume of the water that flew in um, in one second. So what's the volume of this? Well, you know, volume of a cylinder is just area times the height. Well, area is A1, height is V1. So the volume, you know, volume flow rate moving into it is A1 V1. Similarly, the water is flowing out over here. The idea is exactly the same. And therefore here, the volume flow rate flowing out would be A2 V2. And since these need to be equal, there we have it. A1 V1 should exactly equal A2 V2. We call this the continuity equation. And let's see what that tells us. This tells us that if, as water flows, if the cross-sectional area reduces, then since the product needs to be the same, the velocity should increase, which means in this particular example, look, as the water goes from here to here, the cross-sectional area has reduced, so the water must go out faster. So the water is moving in slower, and it's coming out faster. And again, intuitively, that makes sense, right? We want the same volume of water. If five ml is going in every second, five ml must come out. But since the area is smaller, well, the water molecules have to move faster so that the total volume stays the same. Because if the area is smaller, well, then it needs to move faster to have travel a larger distance, right? So that makes sense, isn't it? This is how we are using continuity equation. If we know the speed of water on one side, we can figure out the speed of water somewhere else in a pipe, for example. This is also the reason why, for example, when you pinch you know, a hose, for example, the water comes out faster. It's the same idea. When you pinch the hose, um, the area of the opening reduces, but the volume flow rate has to stay the same so the water comes out 
faster. Beautiful, right? And the same idea holds if you have slightly more complicated pipes. Like for example, if you have like, you know, two incoming waters you know, join uh, and you have an outgoing water over here, for example, or fluid over here, it works for any fluid, okay? The same idea holds true, right? The volume flow rate in that's together, that's A1, V1 plus A2, V2, should exactly the volume flow rate out, which is equal to A3, V3.